house we're floor. occupying the we're house floor because we demand in that black the Florida chambers we will not allow the them to eliminate we two black removed. districts in the we state of Florida so floor. we, we are here until they allow us to get some new maps that do not slash black representation so we are occupying the floor like John Lewis like all of them we're making good trouble we're doing good trouble see here and not sit in these chambers and shut these chambers down until they drew a map that does not eliminate black districts Ron DeSantis is disrespectful Ron DeSantis is a bully Ron DeSantis does not care about black people I will not bite my tongue he, there is an incessant attack on black people in the state of Florida there is an incessant attack on black people in the state of Florida and I am occupying the Florida House Chamber floors to ensure that black people will not be forgotten about. Welcome back to Why Are We Like This, the only true crime podcast that treats Florida like the active crime scene it is. I'm your host, David Quinones. I'm joined by my co-host, once again, Tomas Kennedy. Tomas, what's up, man? You know, I mean, I'm sure you're you're uh, struggling with this, David, but uh, Miami is an active flood zone right now. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's true. Just crazy. <laughs> I'm just keeping the curtains water. drawn. If I could, if I could turn my camera around, you would see that I have my curtains drawn today. I'm in um, what do you call it? Focus mode. I'm uh, not paying attention to the uh, the impending, um, you know, biblical flood that's 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 rising up around us. Speaking of. Um, enormous global disasters our other co-host uh gerald doherty jer how's it going man yeah that was my nickname in college was global disaster um but thank you for having me anyway and letting me solely your brand <laughs> so this week uh we are continuing our exploration and our um and our and our deep dive into you know trying to figure out why we are like this and also spe specifically focusing on um, news that you might or might not be able to use depending on uh, your political persuasion. Um, we are talking about the legislative session, some of the more troubling um, and uh, concerning uh, developments up in Tallahassee, about 600 miles to the north of us. And to help us do that this week, we are joined by our guest, State Representative Angie Nixon, who's been enduring the Florida legislative session, driven entirely by one man's misguided ambition to be president and the raw red meat that he's serving up to his uh, his his constituents and all the rest of us who are not that interested in eating it. Uh, Angie Nixon, welcome to Why Are We Like This? Hi, y'all. Thanks for having me. This sounds like it's going to be fun. Oh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we, we appreciate having you on. Um, it's, it, it, you're, you're a great follow on Twitter, by the way, if anybody's out there on Twitter, go check out, uh, check out Rep Nixon on at Angie Nixon. Um, she's a lot of fun to uh, follow. She's also very, uh, very unique in the Florida legislature in that she's a concise and, um, and, and really good communicator, which can be a bit lacking, particularly, frankly, on the Democratic side of things. Um, it's great to see somebody who just calls things the way they are. So it's it's awesome to this is my first time talking to you. It's really fun to be able to, to, to have you on. Um, I, I wanted to start us off. And I think Tomas wants to, to, to pursue some of this, this 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 line of questioning with you. But to talk about what's happening in Tallahassee right in this moment, I think it's it it's almost helpful to talk about what's happening a few hundred miles to the north in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I'm sure you're I know that you're not um, oblivious to what's been going on up there, the expulsions of um, several uh, elected representatives in, from the state house there. And I'm wondering if like, you could just tell us what, as somebody who's been super outspoken and who hasn't been afraid to put her body on the line when there's injustice happening um, in the legislature, what do you think when you look up there and you see um, folks of a s sort of similar ilk uh, s uh, elected by, um, you know, constituents who have much of the similar makeup to the constituents that you represent and um, and you see these anti-democratic measures being taken against them? Uh, what how are you processing this and like what are your thoughts on, on what's happening in Nashville? Yeah. So first of all, I'm like. Yay, Florida isn't the only jacked up state <laughs> in the country. But then you're like, oh my gosh, that's horrible that Florida's not the only jacked up country state in the uh, country. Um, but it's, you know, I feel for um I feel for Reps Pearson and Jones, but I have such immense respect for them because it's like that's not easy what they did. Yeah. And 
there there's some I know they had this impending feeling of like doom upon them, like even before um, they probably decided to go ahead and do that. Um, because, you know, me and Rep McCurdy did something similar last year and I was freaking out. I was scared and I was like, do I really want to do this? Like the whole time, like, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to do this? But, you know, we don't have anything to lose at this point when you're in a super minority situation, when your voices are are not only not being listened to and heard, but they're being disrespected. And so, you know, we took oaths, all of us took oaths to basically, um, to look out for the entire community as a whole and to just see some guys that are so drunk off power. Like we had to say something, we had to get into some good trouble. And so I'm, I'm happy that they did what they did. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that they got expelled, but hopefully this will agitate people enough to really want to take action and and get involved and change what's going on here in the the Deep South, because we are really in the Deep South. We had Anas Kamani uh, on uh, last uh, week. You know, and we talked about, uh, you know, a number of things that are happening in Tallahassee, some of the special interest driven uh, bills, obviously the abortion ban. That's something that, you know, Anna has really, really uh, focused on. But we also talked about, you know, the the the, the, the Tennessee, uh, you know, uh, saga uh, that was, you know, th- this was, you know, before, uh, you know, Justin Jones was reinstated. So that was great to see. Uh, that at least one of them is having a happy ending. And it looks like Pearson will be reinstated as well, it seems like it. But, you know, something that we talked about was the fallout uh, of that uh, protest that you and McCurdy uh, led, uh, which was rules changes uh, in the in the Florida legislature that would basically allow for the same uh, to happen uh, to any legislator that, you know, chooses to utilize... Uh, let's say, unorthodox, uh, you know, tools in the toolkit to have their voices say, say, heard in what you describe, right, as like a super minority in which, you know, democratic processes and norms are not, you know, respected, to be quite frank. So, yeah, like, can you, I guess, can you tell us about those rules changes and how, like, what's happened in Tennessee has impacted, like, the Democratic caucus and their willingness to do or not to do similar actions? Yeah. So, I mean, basically they can bring it to the body. If, if any one of the members disrupts, uh, you know, disrupts the proceedings of the house and things like that, they can uh, bring it to the body and decide what to do with us, whether to expel us, whether to sanction us, whatever they want to do, they can decide, they can vote on it. And so those didn't necessarily exist before. And folks call it like the Angie Nixon or Travars McCurdy rule. Um, and so we just voted Great. on it. I mean, I'm sure you're it. thinking like, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like, wow. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, so that's where we are. That's what we're here now. Um, as far as like, the caucus is concerned, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. The Democratic caucus here, um, we are, we're stronger than what we've been in the past as far as unity and like kind of moving together. Um, I, do I wish we were a little more outspoken and kind of pushed back? Yes, but I do understand like we need, we need folks at the table we need folks willing to work behind the scenes like we need all of us we need the folks that cause good trouble so i understand some people may be fearful of um you know being expelled or not getting bills passed or money appropriations for their communities for being a little bit more outspoken but like like i tell people a lot of times um I came up here to really try to make an impact in a way that's transformative. And it's not just about like, oh, I just want to get a bill passed, right? Like, no, like I want to get bills passed that are changing our communities for the better. Um, And so that's the type of legislation that I run. It is somewhat provocative to some of them. Um, But, you know, it's, it's, it's common sense, right? I am happy to say though, that, um, 
because the bill that I ran my freshman term, um, which I am now prime calling, uh, the speaker wanted it. This speaker, Speaker Renner, wanted to push it. But it's like it really is a transformative bill. And so um, Rep. Hart is actually taking the lead on it. But I am prime calling it. Prime calling it. And it is uh, the pregnant women in custody bill. So it's allowing um women who are pregnant and incarcerated to potentially um, uh, be able to um, get their sentence um, postponed Mm -hmm. up until 12 weeks after they have the baby. And so like those are types of things, you know, that I feel need to happen in in the state. And I'm not I'm not up here to make friends. I'm up here to really like make my community better. It, it must be so difficult when you have something that feels like such common sense legislation like that. And, and um, there's not really, I mean, like even from, from the right, trying to put my, put ourselves in the, in the furthest conservative, you know, most extreme position. It's like trying to concoct an argument against legislation like that. It, would it, you like to hear the argument? I would love to, yeah. to quote me, Joe Pesci. I would love to hear this. Let's hear it. <laughs> well, what about women who are going to get pregnant to stay out of jail? Oh like, what? Like, oh, I was like, kidding. are you serious? You like, know, that thing that happens all the time. That sounds like a <laughs> Coen Brothers movie. That's ridiculous. That's the most insane things I've ever read. And guess who, and guess who said that my freshman year? Corbett. Who- Oh, Robert. wonderful. Okay. Now, the uh, same person that cussed me and ripped McCurdy out on the floor. Yeah. yeah. The guy yeah. the guy that's in charge of our elections now. <laughs> yep. E- exactly. <laughs> Who I made a res- I made a, 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 an, an erroneous prediction about him, but I think it was only erroneous because it was a little early. I predicted that the whole country is going to come to know that guy's name at some point. Um, mm-hmm. because specifically of what Tomas said, the fact that he's in charge of the elections here. Yeah. And um, I think I was a little, I think I was two years early on that prediction. So, you know, c- g- give me, give me a little bit of grace for, you see what happens in 2024 because. Oh, child. I, yeah. I have a long list of grievances with how the way that elections are, are run in the state and um, they'll end up locking me up in a, in a, in a uh, loony bin probably at some point if I, uh, go through all my cons- uh, conspiracy theories here on the show <laughs> about the way that elections are run in this in this state. All I'm going to say is when you have a ballot that only touches one party's hands from the moment that it's bat- put in until the moment that it uh, that 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 it's ultimately put into the record, like that's that's a little worrisome. Whatever, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> uh, Tomas, I'm sorry, I cut you off a moment ago. Tomas, what were you going to say? No, so Angie, I wanted to ask you, um, because you kind of touched on it when you were talking about your approach to legislating. And, you know, I've I've known you for a while now. We've, we've, you know, we've worked in, you know, different organizations like the, the, you know, in, in, in like the labor movement. Uh, So I, I got to work with you both before and after you became a rep. But I guess my question is, how, how do you like bring your community organizing experience right and like you know like the way that's shaped your worldview and your like political uh opinions and your like you know philosophy to life how do you bring that experience into being like a a lawmaker right and like a legislator in uh right for sure so i would like so (laughs) i think Constituency services is really key as it relates to being an elected official here. Um, We have the power to connect people to services and resources that they otherwise never knew existed. And so since I've been in office, um, I am lucky enough to have, um, you know, been able to help house like over 100 people. Like there were people that were being kicked at t- twice being forced out of hotels that were shut down. And so if I wasn't an elected official, I wouldn't be able to to maneuver in that way, like, you know, connecting people to resources and things like that. And so like also just, you know, as an organizer there in politics, there's really no permanent enemies, except I would have to say like Ron DeSantis and Corbett and folks like that. But um, you learn to really maneuver behind the scenes. And so like I've been having conversations with people and working on amendments for certain bills um, 
to make some bills less bad, right? Yeah. Um, and also like, you know, to kind of help my community out that way. And then sometimes like some of the bills that we're for or the, like that we may put up ourselves, um, they just want the credit. So like I, at the end of the day, I don't care. Like I just want the work done and I want um, that policy um implement it and so like take it right like i know that initially this legislative session i had filed a bill to expand the hometowns heroes program which would have opened it up for more folks to be able to have first time home buying opportunities um from you know from the state to get funding um i withdrew it and was working it and like they opened it up to allow um anyone that works full time in the state of Florida to have access to that program. And so like that's, you know, that's organizing, right? Like talking to them and things like that. And then also like trying to get the community more involved to actually help my cause, to help yeah. agenda our bills, right? To help push them through and really just educating people about what's going on. So like I really just I actually just like organize here as well as I do in the community, just really trying to <laughs> figure out ways in which, you know, I, I figure out the problem, who can solve it and like, how can I like get that person to move? Do, do you think people would be surprised to find out in this state uh, legislative, but particularly in the legislative environment where it, we absorb it, those of us who are living through it, like and are not, you know, legislators ourselves are living or, you know, working in Tallahassee. We absorb it as almost like just like a Sherman tank. And it's like you can't really negotiate with a tank. A tank is coming at you. Would people be surprised to find out that maybe behind the scenes outside of those sort of bigger, you know, the uh, like the, you know, the, the DeSantis and his more like close disciples and, 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 and group that there is some wiggle room. And do you see hope there? Like, I mean, I, I know that you're not going to sit down and find like common ground with like a, a Randy Fine or something like that. But there probably are. I don't know, maybe I'm being naive or something, but are, is there space to, to to do some good in the margins while you're also a super minority? Yeah, I think so. And I think, again, it's just about having um, conversations and like really behind the scenes and really letting people see like where you're coming from. Um, there's one particular rep who like... I'm so I'm so real with it. Like, <laughs> you know, I was speaking to people and then after everything happened, some people stopped speaking to me. And so like this year, I, I, there's one particular rep. I was like, Hey, how you doing? And so he didn't speak. And so I was like, Oh, so you're not, you're not going to speak to me. Anymore? Oh, so like, we're there. Like, oh, we're there. Okay. okay. <laughs> and he's like, Oh no, 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 I'll speak. And so I guess he felt so convicted because later on he reached out to me and he's like, Hey, you know, you were right. You know, I have been kind of avoiding you, but I want to get to know you better. And like, why? He said, why I'm so angry, but whatever. I'm not angry. I'm just very passionate. But anyways, and so like, those are opportunities for people to kind of learn like where I come from, what my community is feeling. And like, you have to take people up on that. Right. And so um, that's what I do. And, you know, this, this year I've really been kind of sitting back and watching to figure out ways in which I can kind of like, get stuff put in and it's kind of been working, you know? And so, um, there is hope. And I, I, I do believe that everyone doesn't think to that extreme. They know this is messed up. Right. Yep. Like, and then also like they can't, they can't do what they want to do. Many of the legislators it's it's top down and that's, that ain't freedom. And so like, there's ways in which you can kind of like work that angle as well. Yeah. Because they've all been drafted into basically the communications and PR shop for one guy running for president. Right. And exactly. like, so their entire, whatever their agenda was when they first decided to pay the thousand dollar fee to run for, you know, state for, for the state house, whatever. I don't give a shit. Because I'm the governor and you're doing my bidding. So there must be some rancor amongst their their ranks, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a little, it ain't, you know, they ain't too happy with, yeah. you know, how things are going and how they don't really have a voice. So um, I'm, I'm, I am very, I am very excited to see what's going to happen next year, especially when the Trumpers and the pro DeSantis folks are like kind of at each other's. 
Uh, yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. We talk about that a lot on the show. <laughs> yeah. No, I have a question, Henji. I I thought about that, right? Like, is the next session going to be even crazier, or maybe is it going to be more moderate because they are like a little closer to like the general election? But it would still right be during the primary season. So, like, yeah, as a yeah. caucus, do you all talk about this? Like, are you all expecting an even crazier session? And like, how can as that even? As a caucus, we haven't. Yeah, as a caucus, we haven't necessarily talked about it. But like, I've talked about, <laughs> I've talked about it amongst like movement people and stuff. I think it's gonna be crazy because you know, again, you have some people that support Trump and you have some people that support DeSantis, and so like. I feel bad for Speaker Renner because I don't know what he's going to do. I know he's going to have a tough time trying to make sure everybody falls in line and be honest with you. And the craziest part about that dynamic is that, like, there's not really any policy differences between those people. Like, they mostly agree with each other on anything that's, like, germane to day to day life. And maybe you yeah. can find something. It's really just like being stuck the culture between. culture wars. Yeah, it's like being stuck between like Selena Gomez and Taylor Swift fans. You're like, I don't know what you guys are arguing about. They both sound fine. I don't know. Like, what do you think? Uh, I, I, I wanted to like, I wanted to try to like um, p- make this top, this, this challenge that you're facing a little bit more like Florida focused, right? Because uh, how do I lead us into this? Me, um, I, think, I think her name is Megan Hunt, who uh, seems to be a pretty effective um, uh, communicator, talking about effective communicators in Nebraska, right? And mm-hmm. we all know Nebraska, generally the demographic makeup of Nebraska. And she had a – guys, I don't know if you saw this. She had um, about a month ago, uh, uh, you know, in, in the in the midst of right-wing lurch in their legislative body, she had a, um, a pretty impassioned plea where she said – I'm sorry to all my colleagues up here on the right. I'm no longer going to be your friend. This isn't cool. This isn't fun. She has a trans. Um, uh, right. So, yeah. And- yeah. Ba- basically was, was threatening to hold the entire legislative session hostage if they went right. forward with this, basically. And I thought that was interesting. And I thought that was a pretty effective way to, um, you know, to to call out and at least get some attention uh, in, in, you know, on, on to the, the fissures there in Nebraska. Right. And then I thought about the way that there are different Floridas and there's really just one Nebraska, but in Florida, there are three different Floridas. There's the Latino Florida, there's the black Florida, and there is a white Florida. And I, I feel like based from my 500 mile away view of Tallahassee, it feels like if um, a black legislator tried to pull a move like that, it would fall mostly on deaf ears and maybe be ridiculed because the fact is that, Black people in this state experience this state differently than white people, and they experience it differently than Latinos, and it doesn't feel like there is much collegiality. And it's great. It's very uplifting to hear you say that, like, you do are able to have productive conversations with presumably white or Latino members on the on the opposite side of the aisle. But, like, what do you think about that in terms of being a black legislator and the natural divide? It's not natural. It's, it's completely imposed. But the divide between, um, you know, these different cultures in Florida and the way that that sort of emanates upwards into the legislature. Do you feel like, le- legislature, do you feel like that that's, that's the case? Like you guys, remember back, T- Tomas, you used to always say like with DC, like, oh, well, the legislators, they don't spend enough time back in their home states and then, or they don't spend enough time here in DC getting to know each other. And I, I just wonder if there's some version of that where like, do you perceive that, um, that a message like that would be taken differently from a black legislator in Florida? I definitely, um, they're I definitely coming to get us. We can't be talking. I'm sorry. I forgot. We're not allowed to talk about this stuff in Florida anymore. It's, they're, they're coming to, they're coming to shut down the podcast. <laughs> no. Um, I, I honestly, yeah, I do. I do. Um, I think like it also varies amongst the different parties as well, but like even, yeah, but regardless, yes, you know, I often, <laughs> I'll never forget. Was it last year or the year before? I think it was last year. I got booed on the house floor. Like it was somewhat kind of in a joking manner, but it was still kind of like disrespectful. Like they've never booed someone because I got up to speak on another bill. And so like that has never happened. Like Rep Escamani, Rep Guillermo Smith, they've spoken out on a bunch of bills, but 
here I am and I got mm-hmm. booed. And so like when I tell you Rip Escamani was pissed. Um <laughs> and so I love I love Anna. She always has my back, her and Ida. Yeah. Um and so yeah, like oftentimes like people again, just like I stated earlier, the other legislator was like, Well, I'm trying to figure out why you're so angry. Like, I'm not like I'm talking. I'm <laughs> When a white mm-hmm. man says something, yeah. it's like, oh, my God, he was so passionate. That was great. And it's like, I'm telling you my communities are hurting or I'm telling you my son, uh, you know, is going through something or my daughter is going through something and this right. bill is making it worse. Yeah. And you're like, why am I angry? But he just said that. And you're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I can't believe you said like. Yeah. But, you know, I'm used to the microaggressions. Unfortunately, I am a black woman, have been one for 39 years. And so, like, this, this is my lived experience. And so it's very unfortunate and it, and it sucks. But um, as far as being in the Democratic Party, we have to figure out a way to, like, to stop that amongst ourselves. Right. Mm-hmm. Especially since the black um community is like one of the, like one of the biggest base in the democratic yeah. party like the, and you we are very dependable and so like when you continually like ostracize us and like don't listen to us you get things like many of the black men are like leaving because they don't feel heard they don't feel like there is a black agenda that folks are you know wanting to push and so here we are now. And so it's the same thing like in the legislature. And how, how do you feel like the Florida Democratic Party is 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 performing right now, is doing in terms of, you know, building infrastructure? I mean, obviously, you know, we we did terribly in 2022. I mean, there's no ifs and buts about it. Um, you know, we have new leadership. Um, yeah. Do you, do you feel like we're in like a better trajectory right now? So I think, I think, we have the potential to be and like let's be real like they we were outspent like yeah. by a shit ton of money like yeah. like a, a lot, lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so you know it, it, that's just absurd there was no way to really like overcome that right and so you're dealing with that but like yes we have to get our act together as far as being in a party um, I think there's some promise. Um, I've had conversations with uh, with Nikki. And so, like, I, you know, I think she's open to listening. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's also just going to really be a matter of, like, not neglecting, like, the black base. Right. Yeah. Like for too long, people just rely and depend on us. But I'm looking at a lot of black entrepreneurs and even black women who are just getting frustrated and not being heard anymore. And they're like, I'm done. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm trying to keep them motivated and engaged. But like, we got to make sure that, you know, like there's something in it for our community as well. I want if I could ask a follow up question on that. Cause earlier, you spoke about you know there being more unity now within the party than you've seen in the past, and I'm the I'm sure a lot of that is the caucus in the caucus. I'm sorry. So um, I'm sure a lot of that is born out of necessity, just you know, given the the nature of the legislation that gets passed and the need for unity in in crafting a response. But I wanted to ask, um, like, because it you know there are a lot of those tensions in trying to create, like you said, an agenda that speaks to every piece of the party um if the caucus were to gain power let's say like the florida democrats had the level of power that the florida republicans have like what would a legislative session under uh, a florida dem trifecta oh my god it would be amazing like the state of florida would just be flourishing like medicaid would be expanded right we would have um Fully resourced public schools. Yeah. Um, I think that. Wait, but these are all actual problems. I thought that the legislature just dealt yeah. with like grievances and like <laughs> and divorce settling and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, oh my God. You know, I, that's, Jer, I'm piggybacking on your question. Like, I would love to know what your pettiest thing would be that you would do. Yeah. <laughs> what would be the pettiest legislature. Like what? We what partisan cable news headline would you turn into policy? We would make corporations pay their fair share. Yes. No more corporate giveaways. Imagine like, that. Imagine that. 
And that means it's more money for more, you know, more things that people want. So like it would be a legitimate people's agenda, like full on protections for tenants, great workforce development, housing available, pushing out horrible slum lords, like all the right things. And so it would be a, it would be a great, a great state. Yeah, I think that's a really good, that's a good point to make, Jared, because I think that people forget, well, I know I forget. I don't want to like just assign this to like amorphous people. I, I specifically forget sometimes that this can be a great place and that there's a reason like I, for me, there's a reason I've stayed in Miami for 17 years because I've, I've lived all over the country and I love this place. I like this place better than anywhere else. And it's like one of the best places to be like, uh, you know, raising a young Puerto Rican family. It's fun. It's nice. It's good. Yeah. The culture's right. I like don't send me back to any of the places I've been to. I don't want to no. go back. I don't want to. When I first when I first moved down, I thought I'd probably be only down there for eighteen months because I was going down for a job and I stayed for four years. No. You know? Yeah. And I mean we, we we have been like a pretty I wouldn't say progressive, but like for like a southern state like Florida was like a a, a a progressive southern state throughout it, spots of its history right like when we had someone like Ruben ask you as the governor right that was like a, a person that like bucked like you know the Dixiecrats and like the racist Democrats of its era and was like a proponent of like civil rights that was like a proponent of like you know like sunshine law and government transparency and like a corporate income tax like we did have like good leadership at some points of like our state's history but like man like in just in the last 20 years particularly like the last 15 you know after charlie chris who you know like he has he had his deficiencies but actually charlie chris was like pretty good in a lot of regards but like god damn we've really gone down the gutter <laughs> like we really need to get our shit together i mean it's been it's been beaten to death but i do think like the popularity of the ballot measures that pass versus the legislative agenda in tallahassee does speak to a, a certain level of dissonance between what the you know what is a priority for an average floridian versus right. what a you know political priority is for the florida gop right and it just goes to illustrate like that our our seats are really gerrymandered because <laughs> if we're voting for things like increasing the minimum wage and allowing returning citizens to be able to vote and then like DeSantis is in office and like all of these Republicans hold whole power, hold this supermajority in both the House and Senate, like something is going on there. So um, the uh the, the the thing that I like kind of find um, most troubling, I would say, is as the uh, opposition minority party, uh, as a key member of that party, and as the sort of like efficacy, efficacy of that party has been chipped away, it, it, I feel like it becomes easier and easier for the machine, the GOP, like larger apparatus to be able to focus more keenly on targets. And I worry, obviously, about our guest last week uh, on Ask Amani. Um, I worry about you. I worry about as there become fewer and fewer voices, it becomes easier to um, hone in, right? And be like, okay, well, that's a target right there. That district's a target. How can we make that district different? Or how can we uh, knock knock out, you know, a, a representative Nixon at the kneecaps or something like that and, and whatever. And that's a chilling effect. And we always talk about that in the context of media or, or, or journalism, right? Like, oh, the chilling effect on journalism. Do you feel like there's a chilling effect right now amongst you and your colleagues where it's like, we got to be strategic. We don't poke a bear. Like, we got to be a little smarter about this. And, and how do you try to navigate that? And yeah. I know that must be tough. Yeah, I think folks are nervous. They don't want to be targeted. But like, again, I think... I'm an organizer. Like I treat this job, it is a job like in an organizing fashion. And so like, I know that my constituents are my, like they're my employers. And so they want to stay educated. They want to know what resources they can tap into and that type of stuff. And so like, that's what I'm starting to like, that's what I'm trying to impart into my fellow legislators. Like let them know, like just educate people about what's going on. If they, 
know what's going on in Tallahassee, they won't be happy. And if they know that you're fighting against it, like they're going to be like, oh, my God, we got to keep her or keep him. And that's that's all like the the reason that the Republicans have been able to get away with so much stuff here is because people don't know what's going on here. And like also because they got a dope ass, like bad ass calm strategy. Like yeah. they're able to like flip stuff around and say all this stuff and message in a, an amazing way. And so like, we have to like put forth our message and just like what you stated earlier, like Gerald, or like what, what what would a good Florida be, Gerald and David? Like, what what would you imagine? Like, that's what we have to start getting out there. Like, Florida could be so much better if we, like, get rid of these people who, since they've been in power, have put us on a race to the bottom. And so, um, yeah, that's what I would that's what I would say to that. No, uh, for, first I wanted to say that, and this is something that I think I struggle with as, as a as a communicator or whatever. But, you know, sometimes I look at, like, my feed and I'm like, God damn, I'm, like, way too negative, bro. Like, I need to, like, give a little people a little bit of hope. So then I'll go on, like, I'll try to post something happy or, like, a win or something, you know. Um, but when you were talking about the Florida that could be Angie, yeah, like, it does sound so much better. And I appreciate that you, like, you spoke about it with such joy, too. Like, it was very yeah. convincing. Like, your tone of voice and your, like... You know, that's just the way that you are presenting it. Uh, and yeah, and I think it's really important. And like, yeah, like the the Democratic Party, um, progressive like forces in the state, like, yeah, we really need to do a better job at that of just like communicating like the horizon and not just like, man, these people really suck because they do. But, you know, we do have a better vision for the people of the state. So I appreciate you uh, doing that. But um, I, I wanted to shift the conversation a little bit. Uh, because, you know, we are like sort of reaching top of the hour and you know your time is limited. But before, you know, I, I want to ask you about uh, some elections that are coming up in your neck of the woods up in uh, the north of Florida and Jacksonville. Um, and yeah, so basically there's like a runoff election for Jacksonville uh, uh, mayor. Like mayor. And, you know, Donna Deegan, uh, who's like a, a, a progressive Democrat, is running against, you know, like Republicans. I guess, can you like just like set the stage of what happened uh, yeah. during the election Ooh, and what you expect for the runoff? Yeah, so for sure. So Donna Deegan um, is a former news journalist in our state hometown girl. And like, she's a progressive, like she's running against a, they call him the golden boy. Like, let's be real. I'm just going to be honest with you. No, like seriously. So when I graduated from college, well, I was in my final semester. I interned in city council. I think he was still in city council then. Um, I interned for Mia Jones, who came, who turned out to be the state rep for my seat. Um, and like they labeled him like the golden boy. And so there was always like, it was always well known that they were going to push him to become mayor. And so they set him up. So after he was in office in city council, he moved on to state rep. And while he was there, like he was, um, over the builders, an organization, the builders. And then he became like the president of the chamber, and so, like, now all of a sudden he's running and I'm like, mm, they said it and they like they built this bench and like this machine into to existence push, to push yeah. this guy through. Right? right. And so now you have like Donna Deegan, who has a real shot of winning because, number one, people aren't happy with like all the negative ads and all that shit that they were running um, against each other, the Republicans early on and like. Also, the fact that Daniel Davis is so far removed from office, um, it's been some years, so people don't know who he is. And then, like, also because, like, people aren't happy with, like, the way that the Republican Party has been running the city. And so she has a really good shot. But of course, you know them, their, their regular MO is, we're going to say she's a... Uh, uh, 
whatever, whatever, police, anti-police, yeah. that type of thing. I ain't going to use that because they might cut it and they ain't try to oh, use yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, No, 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 no. Um, we're not going to give you that they're... acronym that you're begging for her to say. Exactly. No, we're not, we're not doing it. Do it. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so they say that she's dead and they're just trying to, like, label her as this, like, radical person. Um, when in actuality, like she has a great vision for Jacksonville. She knows that there needs to be um, an agenda for members of the black community there, as well as the rising Hispanic community that's um, coming up in Jacksonville, because like my district is changing. And like I was I was telling my husband, I was like, we got to find a Spanish, a Spanish daycare for my daughter, because I want her to learn, like be immersed in <laughs> Spanish and just learn it. And so like because my district is changing and like I want her to be competitive, I want her to um embrace diversity yeah. um, and I also want her to teach me Spanish so <laughs> um, but yeah like Jacksonville is changing um, it's becoming browner it's becoming darker and so like they are they're fearful of that just like they're fearful of that in here in this state and so that's why they are gerrymandering that's why they are um, creating these culture wars to try to divide our communities and pit our communities against each other um and so like that's what's going on in jacksonville hopefully um we're able to turn out folks to vote um we we had been trending blue uh, for a while, and then that kind of changed a little bit with this last election in 2022. Same. And so I know that they, they're going to dump a shit ton of money in this race, just like they dumped in uh, a lot of money in the special election when Tracy Poston was running against, I forgot that guy's name, um, Tracy Loss. But like that was the most money they had spent in a race, um, in the city council race. And they're going to do it again, uh, uh, this, this, this time, this, this electoral cycle. And so like, it's going to be a matter of like, who can get their people out. And like, again, I think we just have to motivate people to see that, that bigger vision of like, a, what a Jacksonville for all would look like. No, I was going to say it's, it's, it's interesting because like for, for, for us, and I don't know about you, Tomas and Jared, but like Jacksonville almost feels like a different state to me because it's if you live in miami it's it's like you don't really go there that often unless there's a specific reason <laughs> to go and i imagine it's kind of the same for jacksonville unless you guys are coming down to south beach there's not like a reason to come hang out in kendall or something like that and um and we talk about how difficult it is specifically for democrats who are always hamstrung financially relative to the opposition and florida is five big distinct media markets and each of those media markets is bilingual if you talk about miami it's trilingual because you better whatever you do you better do in creole too and it's 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 like everything is kind of dispersed and i wonder like i I don't even like i don't even know is jacksonville uh the municipal the municipal elections are they um are they partisan or not are they like clear partisan or not they are they're partisan but they're they're unitarian and so it's top two then they head to a runoff right Uh, Uh, i see okay yeah because here in miami like a lot of our countywide um countywide democratic representation i think the case could be made that the only reason they're in office is because We've talked about this before too. They didn't have to run with D's next to their name during oh. specific years, and um, you know, I was and it, again, the, the, this state is such a patchwork. I'm sorry, Tomas. What were you going to say? Well, first of all, I want to say y'all have like a crazy, in my opinion, city council in Jacksonville because there's so <laughs> many people in it. It's like like 24 people, right? Wait, what? It's 19. It's 19. They consolidated in the 60s because black people were coming into power and there was going to be a black mayor. So they consolidated yeah. and made all these empty promises. And so like now we're here. And so, yeah, it's 19 um, council people. members, uh, five of which are at large members. Yeah. And uh, speaking of um, gerrymandering, right. Uh, and and a dilution of, of, of black voting power. I was also wondering, like, what has been the fallout or, or you know, or, or, or I guess like the political fallout of the gerrymandering and ouster of Al Lawson up in North Florida from his congressional seat? I, we, I don't know what Aaron Bean is doing. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, 
Hmm. I don't know. And, and that's all I can say. You know, <laughs> I ain't seen my congressman in, since he was a state senator. Right. Yeah. He's chilling. That's and that, that's a that's a condition that is um I think uh, uh very um it's catching a lot of us a lot of people around uh, throughout the state. This is uh yeah about as about as um congenital as like uh as uh as COVID. We, we're all experiencing some of that. I think. Um, but before we, before we wrap up with you, uh, I wanted to switch up a little bit and you kind of touched on the idea of uh, earlier when we were talking, um, uh, about, uh, black constituents, reliably black, uh, reliably democratic black constituents in Florida who, you know, all throughout the South, throughout the country, this, this is the most, um, you know, hegemonic, uh, voting block that that the democrats have right that, that that they can rely on we saw it through south carolina we've seen it through countless primaries we know how this is but i think that there is and i'm not alone in, in saying this there is some erosion or there's at least some effort from the right to try to erode or make inroads now at, at what, what what it seems like is a republican walking up and saying hi i'm a republican it's nice to meet you uh, i want to talk to you about republican priorities is not necessarily going to resonate with um, the average black voter and they've earned that and they can wear that. What is a little bit concerning is um, an article that I linked in our show notes uh, that I I wanted to to talk to you about a little bit. Um, And this is from MSNBC and it's a blog post by, uh, by the the readout. Um, So this is the headline is the black culture platforms that push right wing extremism. And this article is focusing specifically on the shade room and no jumper. Uh, which, as they point out, they're ostensibly designed to reach black audience and both have become hubs of extremist disinformation. I've kind of noticed this. And for white people, like we already had Russell Brand and Joe Rogan. So like we know about it, like we've had these guys for for a while. But um, I I had been like a casual fan of No Jumper for a while. And just like just the interviews, like seeing the interviews are, are sometimes good. And then seeing that they're just like putting... Tomas, do you remember who it was with Nick Fuentes or something like, and then like Richard, Nick Fuentes, yeah, and then yeah. Richard Spencer, I think like the former, I don't know if you ever, if you're a former Nazi, I feel like it's kind of a thing you got to wear um, for your life forever, forever. Um, have you noticed this? Have you seen this sort of like these, 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 these um, it's not even like straight, strict narrative or overt propaganda. It's more just like, 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 trope type stuff being shoved into a lot of black media outlets. And I, I have noticed it, but it took seeing somebody else spotting it to, to, to really put a name on it. I don't know. What, what do you think of this? Is this happening within these sort of like yeah. publications a lot? Yeah, it is. Oh, they're the LGBTQ community and, and, and Planned Parenthood. They're destroying the black family. Yeah. And it's like, what? Like, what? <laughs> What are you like, talking about? So yeah, like no, that that's happening, yeah. and so that's what I was kind of alluding to um to earlier, and then also you know they're pushing like pocketbook issues, like black people have been <laughs> so um a lot of black people have been on the lower you know economic socioeconomic ladder, and so like when you have promise. Um, or aspiration, uh, uh, or people are promising and like helping you try to expire, uh, inspire you to, to say you're going to be able to make more money and all this stuff. Like you going to go that way. Right. And like, that's what the Republicans are really pushing. And so it's like this proximity to, to power and to like this capitalistic ideal of like, you know, making yeah. it out and like being rich and this and that. And like, that is what is like driving some members in my community. And so like, it goes back to like what I said earlier, like we have to like let people know that the democratic party, we have a vision for our state, right? Like that you won't be impoverished, not necessarily that it's like, you're going to just be this rich person and this and that, but like that there's going to be equity for all. And that's something that we really have to start pushing because we are losing people because of what you stated, right? Like, because they're like pushing this disinformation and they're pushing, basically they're selling, they're selling to my community kind of what they want. It's toxic. um, It's really toxic. Like you see, and a lot of it will stem off of like very salacious celebrity news. Like some of it will be like, 
like in, the entire vertical of like shitting on like Amber Heard or shitting shitting on like um, on on uh, Megan the Stallion or something like in, in you know in these like tabloid contexts where it's like yeah. you know, look at these lying women and stuff and it's it's like it's you can feel the toxicity coming off of it. But it also just feels like reading World Star back in 2008. And so you kind of have to understand like where the world has moved and there's agenda behind a lot of this stuff. Yeah. If you read this article, they point out that there's actually a lot like a lot of this is being driven in like the a pro DeSantis camp. Like it's being yep. put and in exactly the framing that you just talked about where it's like it's um, it's 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 financially based. It's it's, um, you know, what do you call it? Like uh uh, wealth based almost. It's like, it's like, you know, cultivating your own individual wealth, but sure. Great. Like help your economic situation. But. And they also scapegoat on that too. Like Nick Fuentes is very clear about who he thinks is keeping people financially yeah. down. And like, you know, I think that's why, you know, he and Kanye had a lot to bond over in, <laughs> yeah. you know, in the fall. That's true. So we want to thank you representative Angie Nixon for joining us. Once again, you can find her on Twitter at Angie Nixon, um, Rep- Representative Nixon, like what else can people do? Like what, what would be your call to action to, to today on April 11th, 2023? I would say um, my call to action is to make sure folks, if you're registered to vote, like sign up for vote by mail, get everyone, you know, to sign up for vote by mail, because that's like a reminder that people get right. Um, when you see that <laughs> the ballot is there, uh, cause we get so busy, but then also like getting people registered and also like joining, joining organizations that are doing the work, like your Florida immigrant coalitions, your Florida for alls, your Florida rising, your faith in Florida's and really get involved because these groups are doing the work. Um, they have the tools and resources, uh, to help like turn the state around. And I'm super excited to like be a part of that movement. And I, I honestly think that, you know, like that, that we can win. And, you know, I believe that all Floridians have the opportunity to live healthy, prosperous and safe, but like, we got to get their message out there. And so please join one of these dope organizations and get involved so we can take our state back. I can't wait to live in uh, Angie Nixon's Florida. Um, Angie Nixon, thank you so much for joining us. Thank y'all for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you.